Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, I have made a slight change to the title of the presentation. It was uh, phylogenetics. I changed that to phylogenomics. We'll see what that means and why it's uh, important. Uh, okay, so everyone, uh, with the, what we are going to try to sort of cover today is what's phylogenomics. And once we know that, all these other topics will make sense, so I'm not going to spend any time on this. Uh, everyone hopefully knows what a phylogeny is. A quick review, it's a tree shows the relationships, evolutionary relationships between various species. Uh, why do they matter? At some basic level, it's because everything that we want to study in, uh, in biology, including things like transcription uh, factor, regulations, everything, is uh, sort of makes sense only in the light of evolution. There's this uh, famous quote from Dobzhinsky from 1973, and uh, people in my field, I don't know who exactly, but I think various people have come up with a similar quote that says nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of phylogeny. So everything you want to do that involves evolution, you have to think about phylogenies. Now, uh, these days we get phylogenies from sequence data, right? So you have a bunch of uh, species. You use whole genome alignment, for example. You find regions that are orthologous and you want to infer the phylogeny. We, ho we have a hope to do that because the process that generates these sequences is one that is a function of the tree, right? So you have some ancestral sequence, it goes through various uh, mutations, right? And now the sequences that you have, have sort of are a function of the tree uh, in addition to that uh, initial sequence. So if you're not given the tree, you have the data, you can try to find the tree that has the maximum, for example, likelihood of having generated the sequence data. If you have a model of thinking about how these uh, sequences evolve on the tree, a model of you know, the mutations, then you can compute these probabilities and therefore you can try to compute your tree. So that's sort of phylogenetics 101. One more thing I have on this slide is that when you infer the phylogen uh, phylogenetic tree, you also have ways of computing support for branches. These are, you know, there are various ways to do this, but at the end of the day, this just tells you how much confidence do you have in your reconstruction of this particular branch of a tree. This is a phylogenetic tree. It's just unru an, un an unrooted tree. I'm drawing it as unrooted because that's the kind of tree that from the data we can recover using the models that we typically use. Okay, so what's phylogenomics? Uh, phylogenomics is at some basic level, it's just that instead of now having one gene, you have the genomes of your various species, your four species, you have the genomes, you use whole genome alignment, for example, to align them together, and you find these regions, let's say blocks or genes or whatever it is that you want to call them, you find now, let's say, a thousand different genes, and you want to use all of them to reconstruct your phylogeny instead of one gene. So at some basic level, the premise here is that because genomes are big and you have a lot of data, as you sort of increase the amount of data, what we are hoping is that the error in our reconstruction goes down and also our confidence in our uh, reconstruction goes up. More data, better inference, that's a, a sort of promise. Um, the one quick thing that I should note, when I say genes to, uh, in my talk, I do not mean actual genes in, in sort of functional sense. I'm just talking about a region of the genome which is hopefully recombination free. I think in a lot of uh, uh, Colin's talk, genes was used in a similar way, but you know, there is there's this confusion between, uh, when we say gene, we, we might mean two different things, right? And, uh, one is sort of your uh, protein coding genes. That's not what I'm talking about here. Any region of your genome, I can refer to it as a gene. Um, okay, so th this was the promise. People wrote papers that, says, uh, that said basically phylogenomics is going to bring about the end of incongruence, meaning that we can now infer phylogenetic trees with a lot of confidence and with a lot of congruence because we have genomes. As you can predict, there, you know, a uh, very short while after, people started writing papers with the opposite title, 
phylogenomics the beginning of incongruence. Mm -hmm. It turned out that when we have all these huge data sets, um, or the problems that we have always had with incongruence between various phylogenetic inferences, not only they didn't go away, in some ways they have become more, uh, uh, more obvious. We are, we are getting more and more discordances in various analysis. So what's, what gives? What, what is the problem? Why is that promise not uh, fully, uh, uh, why, why didn't it pan out? Um, there are various reasons. One of them is this idea of gene tree discordance. So gene, dis gene tree discordance is the following idea. As you go across these genomes, uh, or these genomes, uh, various regions can have different true phylogenetic history. Right? So in one part of the genome, you might have human being closer to the gorilla. In another part, you might have human being closer to the chimp. This is not just, I'm not talking about the, or uncertainty in inference of the phylogenies. I'm also not talking about uh, uh, error. I'm talking about the true evolutionary history. It can be different. Now, the question then become, uh, becomes, uh, why can it be different? There are various reasons. Uh, we'll go through all of these very quickly in a second. But because you can have this uh, discordance, now we have to uh, think about and talk about two different kinds of trees. We have to think about the species tree. The species tree is sort of the overall history of the species. Uh, so you can think of each of these branches as sort of a population and how these populations have evolved through time. And then you, can have, uh, can, you need to think about a specific gene trees which are specific to one part of the genome, and they can be discordant. Uh, by the way, feel free to you know, stop me at any point if there are questions, if I'm going too uh, quickly. OK, so what are the reasons for <clears throat> this discordance between gene trees and the species tree? One of them, one of the major ones, is duplication and loss. So um, you know, uh, if you recall from uh, Colin's talk, we have paralogs, we have orthologs. If you have orthologs, uh, if you remember, the common ancestor was an speciation event. So if all the sequences you're using to infer your tree are orthologs, then your species tree um, has a good chance of matching the uh, gene tree. But if you have the paralogs, the his history includes a lot of, or some duplications. And at that point, there is no reason to think that the species tree and gene tree might match. So here is an example. We have one gene uh, where that duplicates. So now we have two copies of the gene, the red uh, copy and the blue copy. And, and then nothing interesting happens. You just have uh, two speciation events, right? So at the end, you have three species. Each of them have two copies. Now, uh, sorry, if I go back, uh, this will be your gene tree, right? So each species here is going to have uh, two copies, right? And this is one copy, uh, this is the other copy. Each of these parts will match your species tree. The entire tree obviously cannot match your species tree. It has more uh, leaves. Now, what becomes really confusing is if you mix paralogs, right? So this is a pa 2A is paralog to 3B. 2A is also paralog to 1B. If you mix and match paralogs together, so if you have not seen the other ones, or maybe the other genes were lost, right? So now you have one copy of each gene. Uh, you might create this gene tree thinking that they are uh, orthologs. Uh, you know, de deciding what is and what is not an uh, ortholog is not trivial, as we saw, right? Okay, so you might reconstruct this gene tree. You'll see one copy for each species, but it doesn't match the species tree anymore. Three and one are going together, whereas in the species tree, one and two were going together, right? So very simple duplication and losses can, gi uh, can give you gene trees that don't match the species tree. Let me see how I'm doing in terms of time. Okay, so that's one cause. Um, the other cause is horizontal gene transfer. Uh, what is horizontal gene transfer? It's just that for some species, uh, bacteria for example, uh, they uh, very often, they just pick up material, genetic material from the environment. Not from their ancestor, but from the environment. And if you have that, then sort of 
for that region where these material were picked up from the environment, that gene tree is not going to necessarily match your species tree, right? So this is a very sort of simplified scenario where you have uh, a, B being sister species, meaning that they evolved from a common ancestor, and you have C also, but some genetic material from C was picked up by the ancestor of B. And now if you look at the gene tree, B and C go together uh, with, uh, you know, to the exclusion of A. This is believed to be rampant in uh, prokaryotes. It's been observed in eukaryotes as well. How rampant it is, I don't think we know. I don't think we know how much horizontal gene transfer uh, happens in eukaryotes. Um, when you have horizontal gene trees, some people argue that at that point a tree is not even meaningful, a species tree is not meaningful. Some people uh, claim it is a still a good model if it's not rampant. Um, so that's, that's, that's a point that people are debating. It's not. 100% clear one way or another. Another similar source of discordance is hybridization. Hybridization is when you have one species that has been, that is created as the result of hybridization between two species, right? So if a new spe if two species that were supposed to be a different species manage to create viable offsprings and those uh, survive, then uh, to become a new species, now you can have this situation where this species B here is the offspring of two species. At this point, a phylogenetic tree, even for the species tree, is not meaningful anymore. Right? You have to have a network. Now, um, uh, there are, you know, that's, so if you think about every region of the genome of B, it has two options. It might have been uh, uh, inherited from A, in which case you get something like the uh, black uh, gene tree, which, uh, which is embedded in the species tree, uh, or the species network. Or you might get something like the yellow one, which is also embedded in the species network. But uh, the two gene trees do not match, so they are discordant but only because of this uh, simple, well, not simple, but because of the hybridization. OK, so you know, one of the problems, with, you know, it's really thinking about networks is very difficult. Uh, there are computational problems. You know, working with the space of networks is difficult. But there are also some very basic sort of conceptual problems, right? I mean, if it is. The case that these species can produce offsprings, you know, what is a species anyway, right? And so you have to now think about how you define the species, and you know, if two things have just barely diverged and then they uh, they come back to uh, uh, you know have some gene flow, is that uh, were they different the species to begin with or not? You know, there are all these sort of more basic questions that need to be answered. And I don't think we have good answers for uh, all those questions. OK, so, so far, um, all these causes of discordance that we have covered required something sort of non-standard to have happened. We needed either horizontal transfer, we needed hybridization. These are, you could perhaps argue, are not a standard. Or you needed duplication and loss, which for some uh, species of standards, for, for others is less, uh, less common. Um, but this source of discordance in complete linear sorting is something that you can get by default. You don't need anything uh, non-standard to happen. So what's in complete linear sorting? Imagine this uh, uh, black tree here. That's your species tree. Each dot here is just an individual or a copy of a gene, um, one allele of a gene, let's say. And so the rows are different generations. And each, so what we are doing is just tracing back the sort of the lineage of each gene, just like you would do in population genetics uh, for a coalescent analysis, right? So these, this is just basically coalescence, but taken into but adding a phylogeny to that coalescent analysis. Now, the coalescent process is a random process, right? So each individual finds a random individual in the previous generation, 
as its parent. And if you think about what could happen in these co uh, random coalescent processes, you could get a lineage tree, a gene tree, shown in blue here, which matches the species tree, right? Just by uh, following up these uh, coalescences, you'll see that human and chimp find their common ancestor inside this population, which was, which was the common ancestor of human and chimp. So your gene tree and the species tree match. Everything is good. But it's a, it's a stochastic random process. It does not have to be the case that they find a common ancestor here, right? Just, so let me just go back and forth here so, oops, so that everyone sees what we are talking about. So here, by just random chance, it could be that these two lineages fail to find a common uh, ancestor, right? Now you go to this uh, uh, region. Now you have three lineages. You have human, chimp, and you also have gorilla. And by random chance, human might find the, the common ancestor with gorilla earlier than it does with chimp, right? So in this case, gorilla and human will be uh, sister to each other in the gene tree, even though in the species tree they are not. So this is just the result of random, the random way in which lineages sort each other out inside the species tree. Uh, you could argue this is omnipresent just because you don't need anything specific for this to happen. Now, the, uh, the probability of this event happening is going to be a function of the length of this branch. In other words, how many of these generations we have here, how many of these rows we have, and also sort of the width of this branch, which is what's the size of uh, these populations, how many dots in each of these rows we have. The shorter this branch, or the higher the population size, the more likely the event of uh, this, this event will be, you know, this incomplete, incomplete sorting of lineages. Um, OK, so it's, it can always happen, but it's likely, it's more likely if you have short branches. OK, so so far what we reviewed was the various ways in which gene trees can be discordant from the species trees. Now we reviewed this so that now we can do something about it. Now we know gene tree discordances can happen, uh, and so therefore we want to account for them. But in, the question is in what way? What do we want to do with it? There are various things that, there are various sort of computational problems that through the years people have uh, developed for sort of taking it in, into account gene tree and the species tree discordance. Uh, the very first one is just mapping a gene tree to the species tree. So if you infer a gene tree from sequence data and you have a species tree that you know, uh, you can try to map them to each other. This is called reconciliation. So the reconciliation is sort of like these figures that I have been showing you where you have this sort of big species tree and you put the gene tree inside it. That's, a, that's reconciliation. It tells you how the gene tree evolved inside the species tree. The second kind of problem that you might want to attack is if you have a collection of gene trees that you have inferred. So the nice thing about gene trees is that we can infer them directly from sequence data. Right? If you have your sequence data, you can go and try to infer the uh, gene trees. Now, if you have a bunch of gene trees, then the question is, what's the species tree? And that's a computational problem you can attack. A third computation problem is sort of that problem uh, uh, reversed. Uh, so let's assume you have a species tree that you, have, you somehow know, right? So for example, if you think about human, chimp, gorilla, we know what the species tree is. But you are interested in the, uh, topol in the uh, phylogeny of a specific gene. You can go and uh, infer that a specific gene uh, tree from the sequence data but you are not, when you do that, you're not taking into account this other information that you have about the species tree. A new a kind of problem that you can define is, can I infer the gene tree taking into account not just the sequence data for that gene, but also the species tree that I know? And this is something that people sometimes call tree fixing. 
Uh, and you know, the reason it's called tree fixing is because you could sort of infer your tree from the sequence data first. You can infer your gene tree from sequence data first, and then try to fix it, meaning that you can try to reduce the error in that gene tree by taking into account the species tree. The ultimate sort of kind of computational problem here is co-estimation, which means I'll give you a bunch of sequence data from various uh, genes, and, uh, and your program should return for me uh, the species tree in addition to all gene trees, all estimated together in a statistical uh, fashion, sort of in, a, in an analysis that takes into account the discordances between gene trees and the species tree, but also takes in into account their dependencies. There are other uh, types of problems that we could also define. Uh, one of the ones that are very sort of relevant to this uh, workshop is the following question. If I'm doing comparative analysis, if I'm, for example, doing the kind of things that uh, we saw in the previous talk, where you have a phylogeny, you want to find uh, transcription factors. What tree should I use? Should I use the gene tree? Should I use the species tree? Uh, if I'm using the gene tree, which gene tree should I use? Those questions uh, ha have to do with basically downstream uses of phylogenetics and how they can incorporate discordance. That's a very sort of good question. I don't think there has been much, uh, much uh, method development in that area yet. I think, I hope in the next few years we will see more of that. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that question much here, but it's something that our community will, will hopefully think about more. Okay, so all three, I'll say all four uh, categories of, the, of problems that I talked about, they can uh, be attacked in three main fashions. Uh, one is to use parsimony. Uh, so we'll go through each of them one by one. But basically, each of these can, can be applied to either one, of the, uh, either one of the questions that we have. OK, so parsimony base. Parsimony base is saying that you, ha you have a gene tree, you have a species tree, you want to, let's say, reconcile them. How do I do that? Try to minimize the number of events that you have to invoke to describe the evolution of the gene tree inside this species tree. So here's an example. You have a gene tree, you have the species tree, you want to map them to, uh, to each other. One way of reconciling them is this reconciliation that involves, so these, these things show duplication events, this is another duplication event, these are speciation events. So in this way of sort of uh, putting the gene tree inside the species tree, you need a two duplication events and a bunch of losses, one, two, three losses. So you just count how many events you are uh, invoking. And then if you have an alternative way of reconciling, let's say this one, you count the number of reconciliations as well. And here you have uh, only one duplication and two losses. So this one has one duplication, two losses. This one has, uh, I think, two duplication and three losses. So you'll say, I, I prefer this one because fewer events have to happen here. That's just, uh, that's, that's the way maximum, or, uh, yeah, maximum parsimony works. So what do we might mean by events? Duplication, losses, in the case of incompleteness uh, sorting, events are those cases where two things fail to coalesce with each other in the, in the first uh, population where they can coalesce. Uh, the nice thing about parsimony is that mapping a gene tree to the species tree, the kind of mapping that we are doing here, this mapping can be inferred using linear time algorithms. So the most, uh, the maximum parsimony reconciliation is linear time. It can be computed in linear time. So everything from there on becomes a little faster. Whichever of those four other questions you want to answer, if you are relying on maximum parsimony, it's fast. But the problem with parsimony is that it's not based on a statistical model. And so there are model-based approaches as well. The model approach, model-based approach works like this. You have a sort of a hierarchical model. 
where at the base of this hierarchical model, you have your species tree. You can think of this as the parameter of the model. Then you have to have a gene tree evolution, gene evolution model that basically, given this species tree, defines a distribution over gene trees. Right? And so you, can, you have to be able to tell what's the probability of this gene tree being generated inside that species tree. There are various models that you could put here. But whichever you use, you get the distribution on gene trees. Now that you have gene trees, the sequence data at this point become sort of conditioned on the gene trees. They become independent from the species tree. So on this gene tree, then you need to have a model of sequence evolution that tells you what's the probability of this sequence evolving on this gene tree. right? And this sequence is conditionally independent from all of these uh, trees. If you, if you are given this gene tree. But if you're not given the gene tree, obviously it's not dependent, uh, independent from them because it has a dependency through the species tree. Right? So the sequences at the of different gene trees are dependent on each other, but they are conditionally independent from one another given the gene trees. OK, so if you have a model for generating the data like this, then you can do the inverse and given the sequence data, compute these parameters using maximum likelihood or Bayesian, uh, Bayesian uh, inference, whichever uh, you prefer. All of these become difficult because computing these probabilities have turned out to be very, very difficult. So it, computing the probability of this gene tree inside this species tree for a lot of these models requires exponential running time. So this, this is not easy. It's conceptually easy. Computationally, it's not easy. There are various models of gene tree evolution. I think I have been going for quite some time, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll uh, skip this. I'll, I'll just mention that there are various models of gene tree evolution that have been created for various, uh, for various causes of discordance, including some models that combine multiple causes of discordance. OK. so. So we saw parsimony-based approaches. They were fast, but they didn't have sort of a statistical uh, guarantees. We had model-based approaches that had the statistical guarantees, but were slow. A third kind of approach is what, what I call summary-based approaches. So here, the goal is the following. You want to take into account those models, those gene tree evolution models. But instead of computing for likelihood under those models, you want to find some summary statistics that have nice properties uh, under those models, but also are fast, uh, fast to work with. So I think the, this, and, you know, and these approaches usually work in two steps. You first compute your gene trees independently from uh, one another from your sequence data. Then you combine them to get a species tree uh, using one of these summary methods. Now, for us, you know, for this to make sense, let's quickly see an example. Okay, so one of the causes of discordance was incomplete linear sorting. We went very quickly over it. There is a model called multi-species coalescent model that uh, sort of describes how incomplete linear sorting happens. One nice thing under this multi-species coalescent model is uh, is that uh, if you have only four species, only if you have four species, then the gene tree that matches the species tree has higher probability than the other two gene trees. right? So in this case, for example, uh, these are actually close to true uh, numbers. So human and chimp are together in about 70% of our genome. The other 30% uh, are half when human is with orangutan or gorilla is with uh, 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 human. OK, so the most frequent gene tree is sort of your most likely species tree. So even without computing likelihood, if you have only four species, you can try to infer the species tree. If you have more than four species, the result I just uh, mentioned is not correct anymore. The most likely gene tree can be different from the species tree. But you can still use a, use a trick. You can take your tree and divide it into all n choose four quartets. And if you do that, again, for each of those quartets, you can find the most likely one. Right? And if you just combine these quartet trees, uh, 
you get a tree that is statistically consistent, meaning that you can prove that as the number of species goes to infinity, you get the correct species tree with high probability. There are, so that's, that's one approach, and you can even take it a little bit further. Instead of taking the maximum likelihood quartet tree, you can, uh, for each of the quartets, you can just weight each quartet by its uh, frequency. Uh, so you have you know, three times in choose four quartet topologies. Each of them has a frequency. You can find the tree that sort of maximizes the sum of these probabilities. And so that's, that's, that becomes an optimization problem. I'm going to go very quick over this. The optimization problem becomes uh, NP-hard, unfortunately. But uh, you know, we have developed a dynamic programming to solve it. Um, the dynamic program would be exponential running time, but there are constrained version of the problem that you can also so uh, solve, uh, that you can solve in polynomial time while keeping the statistical consistency uh, results. Okay, so let's, let's just uh, summarize what we saw so far. So we saw that you know, gene trees and the species trees can be discordant. We saw that there are three main ways in which discordance can come about. There is duplication and loss. There is hybridization or a horizontal gene transfer and ILS. For each of these, there are statistical models. There are also some statistical models that combine two or three of them. We saw that there are four questions that we might want to answer. One is mapping gene trees to a species tree. The other is inferring a species tree from gene trees. The third one was sort of improving gene trees, knowing the species tree. And the last one was co-estimation of gene trees and the species tree. And we saw there are three different approaches to solve these problems. OK, so in terms of actual tools, uh, I'm not uh, going to ask you to read all of this. The point of this slide is just to make the point that this is a very active field. If I show this slide a year from now, it's going to be completely outdated. Every day there are new tools for each of these problems, for each of those models, for each of those approaches. There are a ton of different tools out there for, uh, for phylogenomics, for each of those steps. And so, so then the question is, uh, and by the way, even though we have all these tools, uh, we still don't have any tool that's scalable and can handle all causes of discordances simultaneously. Um, so that, that we don't have. But we do have all these tools, and the question is, which one should I use? And it's obviously going to depend on your, uh, on your question and, and your set of species that you want to uh, study. The first question you should be asking yourself is, what is the cause of discordance that I have to worry about the most? Right? So if you are working on plants, for example, maybe gene duplication and loss is what you worry about the most, because duplication and loss is very prevalent there. If you are working on birds, uh, you know, they have a lot of sort of short branches in the species tree, and, and therefore maybe incomplete linear sorting is what you have to worry about the most. Right? So you have to figure out if you're working on bacteria, you cannot uh, ignore horizontal gene transfer. The cause of the discordance that you expect is uh, the first thing to, to worry about. Now, ideally, we, we, shouldn't have asked, we shouldn't ask this question. Ideally, we would have a model that includes all forms of discordance, and we let the model figure it out. But right now, the way things stand, we don't have such approaches. So, you sort of have to decide in advance which cause of discordance you're working with. Another uh, issue is um, the amount of uh, noise that you can, uh, you, you have to uh, expect in your gene tree estimation. So gene tree estimation, the input to it is a short uh, sequence, one gene, let's say, I don't know, 1,000 base pairs, and you are trying to infer a tree from that. Oftentimes, that inference is very noisy. You cannot have high confidence in the result. So what is shown here is across, I think, 8,000 different gene trees that were uh, inferred for one bird data set. 
the majority of the branches in gene trees had like zero percent support, no support at all. And then some had hundred percent, and there were you know there was everything in between as well. So how to deal with uncertainties in the inference of gene trees and the species tree is very important. And uh, you know, tree fixing is uh, something that can be helpful here. Another central thing that you cannot ignore is data set size. If you are working with five, six, seven, ten species, it's a very different ball game than if you are working with a thousand species. And we have both types of uh, data sets. If you are working with very large data sets, co-estimation is not a possibility. You, can, you are only pretty much left with those summary methods that I uh, mentioned. Okay, so the slowest thing is co-estimation. You can only use it for maybe tens of species. A little bit the slower are statistical methods that are not doing co-estimation, and the fastest thing are parsimony-based or summary-based approaches. And, and then you know, beyond the, these general sort of concerns, some methods are just, just have better implementation, and that, that for better or worse, it matters. Okay, so let me just summarize. Uh, we just saw that you know, what, what we covered was that gene trees can be discordant from each other and from the species tree. You cannot ignore those differences. You can try to infer species tree from the gene trees, and you can also try to improve your gene trees given the species tree. We did not talk about what we do with the gene trees if you have them. Uh, you, will see, you have seen some uses in the previous talks. You will see more in the, in the future talks. but. Uh, if you are interested in some traits and you don't know which gene they correspond to, there is not a whole lot that you can do today. So you are pretty much left with using the species tree uh, for doing your comparative analysis. And that's hopefully what uh, the field of phylogenomics in future will figure out, how to use a specific gene trees to do the kind of comparative uh, genomics that we have uh, uh, that we have been seeing in the other talks. Okay, so that's all I had. Uh, these are some various references that will be helpful if you wanted to learn more about G3 discordance. And with that, I will I, I will stop. Thanks. Thank you.